Number one thing I, I, I have uh, is the biggest issue I have at the university system right now is enrollment, and it's not a secret, right? It is a major challenge that we face is declining enrollments. And, and I don't think using the word hemorrhaging is an exaggeration. I think we are hemorrhaging in enrollment. We need to plug the hole. We're not plugging the hole. And there's some things we can do, hopefully, to do that. The last six years, we had declining enrollment, at an ex at it, and it's accelerating, right? The, and I'll show you the numbers. Enrollment is a big deal. Why? Because our whole core job, the existence of the university, is to educate students. And if we're not educating students, we're not putting students in our seats, then uh, we're not even doing our core function, which is to educate those students. So why do we have a decline in enrollment? Um, fewer students is a big deal, right? Calbert comes to the legislature every year, uh, and his job is to get money for the university. And I don't blame him to do that. When we have decline in enrollments, we have declines in tuition. Right? And we'll look at the decline in tuition at UH Hilo just this semester alone in the shortage of the students we have. So decline in enrollments result in a tuition loss. Um, it's a concern for students and the faculties and communities that are intertwined with our institutions. And to me, it's now a matter of statewide concern. The University of Hawaii has autonomy. It's constitutionally mandated, right? The legislature is not supposed to micromanage a university. I don't want to micromanage a university. I don't expect our new region to micromanage a university unless it's a matter of statewide concern and then that's when you have a little bit of legislative overreach um, because now it affects the entire state. I've heard the rationale is that we're mirroring national trends. Universities all across the country have declining enrollments. It's because the, uh, um, the economy is doing so great. Students are not coming to school, they'd rather go to work. And maybe that might be true, but that's not an excuse I want to keep hearing for declining enrollments. We need to fix it, and we need to fix it now. Here's, I want to show you this, and this is important. Okay, these are historical numbers for the University of Hawaii at Hilo starting from 2011 through 2016. Our highest enrollment, at least in the last five years, was at 4,157 students. We've declined in enrollment every single year. Last year, we had 3,666 students. And the projected enrollments was to continually decrease, but to be no more than 3,522 students by the year 2022. Now, what's interesting also about this is if you look at classified students, the undergraduates last year were 2,962. So our undergraduates are below our classified undergraduates are just below 3,000. And that's important because I'll show you another slide in another second. Another important uh, slide uh, number to look at is our first time freshmen. 369 students, first time freshmen, and 197 students that came from our public high schools. That was last year. The reason why I wanted to show you the classified undergraduates is because the classified graduates are 565 students at UH Hilo, right? So we're just under 3,000 for classified undergrads. We have about 565 classified graduates. And of those classified graduates, 349 students are in our postdoctoral programs, our, our pharmacy programs and our, our um, uh, doctor of nursing programs. If it wasn't for the College of Pharmacy, we wouldn't even have half of that number there. So the College of Pharmacy um, brings in a good amount of students along with our nursing programs and that constitutes 349 students. This is important because this is Hawaii's public high schools and what graduated in 2015, 2016. About 10,000 students statewide. On the neighbor island, 2,931 students and on Hawaii Island, 1,228. So 1,228 students graduated from Hawaii Island's public schools. They were seniors last year. Do you remember how much students were first time freshmen on the two slides previously? First time freshmen, 369, right? But how much came direct from Hawaii's public high schools? 197. We're not even recruiting in our own backyard. We have Waikia High School right across the street. They have 400 students graduating every year, and we're not even getting 10% of those students. So I truly believe we're not even starting on our island for recruitment. This is where we need to start. This is enrollment targets by campus unit. This is what came from UH's slide, what they wanted to 
their target goals were for the fall of 2016, or I mean, excuse me, for the fall of 2017. So for UH Hilo, you saw that number, right? We were at 3,666, 3, and our target goal was 3,650. Okay, so target, target goal, 3,650. And if we go back here, IRAO, a, re, a research arm at the University of Hawaii, was putting it at 3,579. So how much students do we have this year? We wanted 3,650, and we have 3,466. So we didn't even here at UH Hilo, based on our enrollment management plan, meet the target that we were striving for. And I want to know why. And, and you know, I'm not um, putting the enrollment management plan down, or all of the hard work that was put into that, but we didn't meet the target quota that we wanted to. If we don't do something dramatically, we're going to continue to lose students, and we're going to drop below 3,000 students, I honestly feel, in the next three to five years. Because that 3,466 is already below the 2022 estimate by, by University of Hawaii's research arm. We're already below that. So I hope this alarms you as much as it alarms me. And I'm here to help solve it. And I have some ideas of how to solve it, and I hope you do as well. But those are the numbers right now. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, UH Manoa's numbers have come in yet. Calvert, do you know if we hit that number? We did. Fantastic. We did, we did not hit that number. OK. And that's all right. You know, if we have a problem, we should all be in this uh, uh, ohana to fix it. You know, but we need to acknowledge we have a problem. Now, I will say UH Manoa, President Lasner's and his enrollment management, management team, you know, they had a very aggressive plan. And if you look at the plan, it's full of numbers and statistics. I look at his PowerPoints, I watch the videos. It's a lot of quantitative data, and data is a good thing to have. The president is, uh, has an extensive IT background. I would expect to have an extensive quantitative data analysis of enrollment and why students are not coming back. And then we had solutions on how we're going to fix it. But we're at 34. We're at, um, I already showed it to you, right? We're at 3466. So we, I mean, we have to do something else in addition to what they're planning to do as well. So what does this mean? We have five consecutive years of decline enrollment here at, at UH Chilo. The largest decline is with continuing students. Continuing students constituted last August 22nd, 2,384 students. Fast forward to last Tuesday, we had 2,227 students. That's a decline of 157 students that chose not to return to UH Hilo following their freshman year as continuing students. Why was that? We need to find out why. The economic impact to that on students that are paying $7,200 in basic tuition at UH Hilo, just on tuition alone, is $1.1 million in lost tuition dollars. And that's when it starts mattering to our, our chief financial officer because you know, every university of all the campuses has its, has its own allocated budget, right? And tuition revenues make up a big part of that. Now, a positive thing for UH Hilo is that first-time freshmen did increase from 421 students up from 374. So 47 more first-time freshmen came to UH Hilo, which is a good thing. It means we're recruiting at the high school level or some of our marketing efforts are working, but we need to, we need to accelerate that. We need, we need to improve on that. What I would like to see as the future for UHH and Hawaii Community College is a 10-year strategic target of over 5,000 students at UH Hilo and 3,500 students at Hawaii Community College. Here at UH Hilo, we have the physical facilities to grow that enrollment number. And, and those are built on the backs of guys like Harvey Tajiri and Gerald DeMello and others that built the infrastructure here that got the CIP money and, and we owe them the enrollment to do that. Right? A lot of people work very hard for the facilities and the buildings that we have here today. We need to fill those seats up with students. Hawaii Communities College's campus is another question. We'll talk about that in a second. But I would like to see that campus relocated to Komohana Street. I would like to see the 24 acres that's landlocked monetized, and we can do something with that. Um, and we can grow Hawaii Community College to over 3,500 students, increase its vocational programs, because HCC has, plays a pivotal role on our island. We have over 2,500 students that go to HCC. We have just under 3,000 students that are classified undergraduates. 
HCC holds their own. You know, there's a lot of students that go there for various reasons, whether it's tuition, they just want to get their associates in two years, they want to enter the workforce, whatever reason. And we have about 500 students at Palamanui. But in order to do that, our recruitment strategy and our marketing strategy needs to be aligned. We got to focus in our own backyard. We got to focus on this island first, of course, the Asia Pacific, the US mainland, and international students. We have to add value, value added branding. Students need to feel like they're getting a value for what they're paying for. That the degree that they're getting, the education they're getting is a quality education, and they can take that degree and that experience into the workforce and get a good paying job. So I can provide for their families, hopefully not leave them with student debt, and, and, and get them going out into the world. We should ex establish high expectations for everybody. The president, administrators, the chancellors, division chairs, deans, community members, your senator, all of us should have high expectations of how to increase student enrollment. Recruitment is extremely important. I think we need an intense recruitment effort to the degree like you, know, you have uh, the best football coaches in the country and, and uh, professional recruiters that go out to recruit students. I don't want students to come to us, I want to go to them. I don't want them to just wait and hopefully they get inspired at a college fair. I want to inspire the students even before they get to the 11th grade or before they get to the 12th grade. I want to start touching them. We have a P through 20 program. I want to start touching them when they're in the elementary age, intermediate, and the high school age. And so when, when it's time to pursue higher education, it's a no-brainer that they're going to choose one of our 10 higher education institutions in this state. Like I said, we want, I want to strengthen our P through 20 statewide partnerships that we have with the Department of Education. Look at a cradle to career program for recruitment. Our recruiting materials, our outreach, our summer programs, our marketing, our outreach strategy, our social media, those all need to be in sync. We should improve the financial aid process, right? And how students can apply and get, and get money and get Pell Grants and get scholarships. It's very confusing. You know, I don't see why every student, high school student that doesn't graduate should just fill out the FAFSA and see what they can get for a Pell Grant. Students don't even know how to fill that out. You know, we should be going to them. And I intend to go to them this fall, at least. I'm gonna start off at YK High School and Hilo High School. And uh, you know, my, I'm just, what I feel I'm gonna try and do to help inspire kids to pursue higher education. I think we need to invest in our faculty. You know, we talk about recruiting students, but what about the faculty? We need to recruit quality faculty. Um, we need to give them, you know, reasons to want to come to Hawaii. We need to improve that teaching environment. We need to allocate them the appropriate resources and the facilities that they teach in, you know. There's been a shift away from tenured faculty track positions to lecturers and graduate assistants. You know, I don't want to devalue our faculty. And I really feel like faculty recruitment and retention is key. We haven't done a good job as a state to provide faculty with quality housing. You know, it's very expensive to come to Hawaii. And when a faculty member looks at the salary, the cost of living, and all of those things, they're gonna make a decision just like many of our friends and family are doing on this island. I'd rather go to Las Vegas and get a job. I'd rather go to the mainland and get a job because it's cheaper, I can get paid better. Might not be Hawaii, but at least I can have a better quality of life. So we need to address that. I also think we need to improve on our non-traditional distance learning programs. There's a lot of non-traditional um, older um, adults out there that wanna go back to pursue higher education, but they might have kids. So it's to have a child care program where they can bring their kids, you know, a place that, th that their kids can uh, uh, be watched for a few hours so they can, uh, they can go to class. Retention. If there's one thing we're not doing, we're not retaining students after their either first semester or freshman year. That's where the biggest loss is for enrollment. Students are coming to UH Hilo. It's not what they thought it was going to be. The highest number is from the mainland and they don't come back after their first semester or they don't come back after their first year. And that's a big problem. Retention has always been a problem. How do we get students to want to come back and finish their, uh, their higher education here at UH Hilo? 25% of all the freshman students system-wide don't return to UH for their sophomore years. And I know the president and his team are doing systematic surveys on why that is. Why do they not choose to come back? Is it financial? You know, they were over it. They thought uh, Hilo was Waikiki. You know, what's, what's the deal? You know, we have new student orientation programs. Ch uh, President's talking about week of welcome that, that I believe we do. It should, be a wel it should be a semester of welcome. We should do everything we can as students, as faculty, as community members to welcome first time freshmen, encourage them to come back, especially if they come from the mainland. 
What we know is if they don't connect to us in their first few weeks on campus, then they're not going to come back. And so how can, we, how can we do that? Of course, enhancing retention scholarships, we have money. We can entice students to want to come back by giving them a scholarship. And then community mentoring and family sponsor program is an, is an idea I had. I talked to the uh, interim chancellor about it, and she thought it was a great idea. And the idea is this, right? We have a lot of committed members, com committed community members here who have been to the UH Law Distinguished Alumni Awards. It's packed, right? So there's a lot of people vested in this community. What if we had a sponsorship program where we have a first-time student from the mainland, has no friends here, never been to Hawaii, but for some reason chose UH Law, come here with their parents, you know, get their students set, their child settled, head back to the mainland on a student's here for the first time. What if we had a, bit, a, a group of several hundred members of our community, and I see many of you here tonight, that are willing to say, you know what, I'll sponsor this student for this first semester. I'll invite them over to my house for dinner. I'll get to know them. I'll take them, I'll take them around, show them Rainbow Falls, talk about the culture, the language, because I want that student to come back next year. How many of us w would potentially think about doing that? I would, no question. Matt would. If it made that student more comfortable and want to return, it establishes a bond with that student. They're likely to return. Their parents are going to feel comfortable with their student being embraced by the community. They're going to come back to Hilo. Whether they stay in Hilo and pursue a career, go back to the mainland, Hilo is going to be a home for them. They're going to have a family here. They're going to come back here. Their parents are going to come back here. So that's a lifelong bond we could create with especially those first-time freshmen that come here to UH Hilo. We should have a target goal of zero. All freshmen, first-time mainland students will return for the second year. 100% if possible, right? We need to plug that hole immediately and that's an idea uh, that I talked to uh, Chancellor Sakai about. She's all about it. Um, you guys are the next ones to hear it. But that was an idea I had. How can we get engaged as a community to do that? Student tuition. One of the reasons I personally feel um, is a barrier to higher education is the cost of student tuition. And here's the facts. You know, I've wrestled with my good friend Calbert and the president on student tuition and, and, and many, many other people that have different opinions. But, but to me, it is what it is, right? Here in America, student debt represents $1.3 trillion. That's a fact. Student debt in America has surpassed the total amount of credit card debt that all Americans owe. I have a fundamental problem with that amount of student debt. The average student that graduates from the University of Hawaii system carries about $22,000 in student debt. Higher education has become a $500 billion industry. It's an industry. College prices are rising faster than income levels. Pretty soon, the middle class are going to be priced out of a higher, pursuing higher education. It's either going to be, you got a lot of money, and you can pay for it, or you don't have a lot of money, and then you can qualify for financial aid. But if you're in the middle, your parents are going to have to take out loans, you're going to have to take out loans. And uh, you know, I really feel here in America that we shouldn't be saddling students with, with college debt. I agree it's an investment in their future. You know, the university will say it's a worthy investment, that our tuition is cheaper than our peers. But I still think we should challenge ourselves to not graduate a student with student debt. Um, a recent article done because the reporter on UH Manoa's decline in enrollment. They interviewed the principal of McKinley High School, big school in Honolulu. The first thing he said was, students want to pursue higher education, but it all comes down to cost. The cost factor is still a prohibitive element and a barrier since many local students are subsidized. Here in East Hawaii, a large amount of our public DOE schools are subsidized. The only non-Title I school, Title I means free and reduced school lunch, here in Hilo is De Silva School. Every other school is subsidized. Hilo Union is 70% subsidized. That tells you the economy that we have. Those students, they don't even look to come into UH Hilo because they can't afford it. Barely get into HCC. So they just write off pursuing higher education because they can't afford it. They, may, they might not even know they can get the Pell Grant. And even at that, the Pell Grant will only get you five, $6,000 for five semesters, right? Eventually, you're gonna run out of money. So, I would personally like no tuition increases by the Board of Regents until we can 
get our financial house in order. I introduced a bill to do that, didn't get through, but I wanted to send a message that I really feel that, that uh, student tuition um, has really skyrocketed. Through the help of the university and the legislature, we passed the Hawaii Promise Program last year. And that was a program that was aggressively championed by um, uh, great leaders like Calvert that filled the unmet need for a community college student if they can't afford that extra little bit to go to college. The university meets that. And we appropriated about $1.7 million to the Hawaii Promise Program for two years. And there's what, Calvert? About 1,000 students statewide going to take advantage of that? So that's an awesome thing. You know, and that kind of goes in line with what other states are doing for free community college. The state of Tennessee has free community college. The state of New York has free college. The state of Tennessee does it through their statewide lottery. So pretty tough to get gaming through the legislature. But then we could have free college for everybody. But uh, um, you know, I also think uh, our FAFSA applications need to increase. Like I said, I think every high school, if I go to Waikiki High School and talk to the seniors there, my goal is gonna be that every single student at least fills out the FAFSA. At least try, you know, see what you can get. Okay, why is student tuition to me such a big deal? This is where student tuition was in 1995 and 1996. The blue line represents uh, in-state, the yellow line represents out-of-state. It was, you know, just a little bit of history, okay, so, the UH system started in 1907 through the Morrow Act, Land Grant College. Okay, from 1907 to 1995, all tuition revenues went to the general fund. We never went to the university. Everything went to the general fund. And so there's no reason to increase tuition. Well, it was also not a great thing to do to increase tuition because that would have fell to the legislature, and that's not a politically wise thing to do. Well, when we had declining revenues in the early 1990s, the Japanese bubble, there was declining revenues to the University of Hawaii, just like it was during the 2009 Great Recession. University said, we need more money. Legislature said, fine, you want to raise tuition? We'll pass a law in 1995, which they did. And uh, it, for the first time, allowed student tuition rates to be set by the Board of Regents, and for all tuition, 100% of it to go to operating costs at the university. And what happened? Tuition went through the roof, in my opinion. Tuition at UH Mono alone went up 620% since 1995. Tuition here at UH Hilo is about $1,500. It's now $7,200. And the tuition rates are set as follows, are now set by the regions through 2020. You can see UH Hilo tuition is going to be 7344 for a resident. And for the graduate student, it's 11,000. Of course, you pharmacy students know it's much more than that. But the biggest number is the out-of-state students. The out-of-state, non-Western University Exchange students pay $33,000 per year at UH Manoa and $20,000 per year here at UH Chilo. That's just for tuition. That doesn't include room and board. That doesn't include books. It doesn't include fees, the Student Life Center, it doesn't include the meal plan. So for a student to go to UH Manoa for one year, it's over $50,000. And that's not for a specialized program. That's for just for an undergrad program. And you guess what, what's ha not happening? Mainland students are not coming. Because they can, go to Los they can go to Nevada, Reno. They can go to Boise State. They can choose somewhere else because we continue to raise tuition. There are, there are Western University Exchange to, um, universities on the West Coast that are cheaper than some of our UH system campuses right now. And so students are now given a choice, right? And everything comes down to money. But these are the, these are the current rates that are set. I'd like to see these not go any higher right now until we can solve some of our other problems, like increasing enrollment, which will bring in more tuition, cutting costs, increasing efficiencies. But it is what it is. But the legislature doesn't give us enough money every year, so we have to raise tuition. Well, this is important. In 2008 or 9, $463 million from the state's general fund went to the University of Hawaii. And just like we all know, the financial um, crisis of 2008, 2009, when the banking industry went south and there was a recession nationwide, especially here in Hawaii, the general fund allocations to the university plummeted, almost $100 million. And you can see what the rates were, at least for four years. And then the economy started getting better. 
and general fund revenue started to improve to go to the university. And I think last year was about 470, 460, 70 million. It's not enough, trust me. I wish we could give more out of our general fund to the university. But the fact of the matter is, in 2017, at least in this budget year, it's back to, what do you say, 2009 levels? I mean, we're not factoring inflation and all of those things, but we're getting back to where we were prior to the recession. Now, this blue chart here constitutes tuition revenue because there's two major funding sources that the University of Hawaii operates under. Could be three, but the two big ones are general funds and student tuition, followed by research dollars and grants. And in 2016, about $303 million worth of operating revenue for the University of Hawaii system came from student tuition. And that's why those rates are set. It's just, I want you to see that, right? I, I, I always hear tuition, you keep complaining about tuition, but the legislature doesn't give us enough money. Well, we're back to where we kind of were, you know, around 2008, 2009 levels. Just a gee whiz here, this is what the university budget looks like. Like I said, this was uh, in 1516, 427 million came from the general fund, 572 million came from special funds, which includes tuition and fees and some other pieces of the pie. But as you can see, we're looking at a billion dollar enterprise at the University of Hawaii. And that is why it is an economic engine for this state. But it's still, in my opinion, the state's most underutilized public resource. Governance. Governance is extremely important to me. Uh, why? I've had a chance to talk to a few faculty members and over you know, my time as a higher education chair, I personally believe in shared governance. Now what does that mean? You know, I really mean, think it means we have system-wide organizations, whether you're in the faculty senate, the student senate, different organizations that should work collaboratively, faculty, staff, students, administration, to effectively share in that key decision-making process, shared governance. That governance should be broad and unending. The communication should be um, back and forth between those organizations. Shared governance, why is it important? It fosters trust. It fosters a culture of collegiality and a, a culture of inclusiveness. You as a faculty member, you as a student or staff or admin, feel like you have a say. And you're invited as true partners in uh, this transformational effort. It's participatory rather than top down. We're not gonna, at the system level tell you what to do, we're gonna make it inclusive, make it participatory. Somebody ultimately has to make a decision, I respect that, but we need to do a better job of shared governance at the system level. Something that brought up a lot of angst the last year to two years here at UH Hilo was its College of Arts and Sciences reorganization. You know, I know uh, everyone has different opinions on that. Um, that was a product that was the University of Hawaii Board of Regents said. We need to look at a system-wide reorganization and a streamlining of programs. And that was a challenge they made to the chancellors. Chancellor Strainey took it upon his job. You know, at the time, uh, Matt Platts was Vice President of Academic Affairs, and they worked on a reorganization plan. I'm not sure where that plan is. I'm not sure what the interim chancellor's position is on the reorganization plan. But my question would be, is that a plan that we should look at moving forward with right now? Or should we give, uh, the new chancellor that's gonna come in, which could be a little while from now, an opportunity to look at that reorganization, or at least hear from the faculty and see if it makes sense. Student life. How do we increase student life for students? And the reason why there's some blank spaces is I wanna hear from the students. But I really believe there should be a strong campus pride. I'm gonna talk about the Vulcan Village in a second and its project development. You know, I talked to students last year when I came here and they said, you know what, we used to go to um, Model UN for international exposure, but we don't have any funding to do that anymore. And I thought that was a fantastic program. So we should have baseline funding for that, or we should earmark funding for that, and we should give students an opportunity to go to that, because it's an opportunity to network with peers from all over the world. We can improve on our college community, on our campus life, through additional food options, cafes. We can do better at Hale Alahonua and provide better uh, food, food options there. And, and for student life, we should immerse our, our students in culture, in what makes this island and Hawaii special. 
its heritage, its language, and its lifestyle. For facilities, this is a big thing, right? Because you, the UH has a lot of land. And, and I really feel like we're not monetizing our assets well enough. It's, it's not easy to do that. It's, it's easier said than done, just to say, oh yeah, go ahead and monetize that, that piece of land there. It's, it's not that easy to do that. But I think that is one of the keys to uh, building 21st century facilities at UH Hilo and HCC. By monetizing our assets, we can enhance revenue enhancement. We can build student convenience and access. We should be actively pursuing and developing private investment through public-private partnerships and innovative revenue generating strategies that develop and promote growth. I would like to see a business vanguard community created here at UH Hilo. There's some great people in here that have developed projects before. I see Illinois right here. You know, he has expertise in that. We have community leaders that are willing to, to be a part of that process. Um, we need to engage them. I'd like to see distance education centers. Senator Russell Rudiman talked about a distance education center in Pune, which is the fastest growing district in the state. It's got 50,000 residents. We should have a distance education center in Kau, if possible, just like the one that we have up in North Hawaii at uh, Honoka'a. Carlton Ching is the UH Director of Land Development. He specializes in land deve development, but he develops and he looks at properties and assets that are told to, for him to look at by Jan Govea, who is our uh, capital or our CIP um, leadership uh, um, person, I guess, under President Lasner. But I would like to see Carlton Ching engage with this business vanguard community or organization to help develop some of the assets I want to show you in a second. Of course, we can utilize pri private developers and through public-private partnerships. Those of you who go down to Pahoa, that whole new Pahoa village market, that's a development. We can engage with that individual who did that. Tower development, Ed Boshur, who's redeveloping Anani Loa and is now going to redevelop Uncle Billy's. He has expertise in development. And I want to develop this, the Vulcan Village. In 1999, some hard-working people, um, I don't see him here, but Gerald DeMello is his name, amongst others, got Governor Ben Cayetano through executive order to transfer a 36-acre parcel to the University of Hawaii. And if you're not sure where this is, we are right here. Well, this is Kapilani Street, so we're like up here. Here's Ale Hale Alahonua. So we must be right here. This entire 36 acre parcel, this is hopefully what the Poinaco extension will one day look like, was through executive order transferred to UH to build a Vulcan village, to build a China educational center for excellence, for retail and commercial purposes. And that was going to be the benchmark of creating a college town that leverage university assets. It would provide housing, restaurants, retail, commercial office space, and urgent care clinics. So when you, as a student, get sick, you can go someplace. And you don't have to get a cab or borrow a car if you don't have a car. You can walk there. It would have entertainment, coffee shops, and cafes. The chancellor, the previous chancellor, tried to, right? The sign is over there. The sign's not up there now, but the posts are there but they got no takers. We came very close in 2009 to having Chinese under Chancellor Rose saying Chinese developers from Taiwan developed this, but it never happened. So I want to know what are we going to do about it? You know, when are we going to develop this? Because for you students there, imagine if you had an amazing um, place you could go to right across from the Vulcan Athletics, and there was a, maybe not a Buffalo Wild Wings, but there was a place we could go <laughs> You could eat, you could watch sports, you could, in, you could in, enjoy, you know, you could, you could go somewhere um, that didn't require you to get a cab to go down to Cronies or, or, or to go some other place in, in Hilo. You could do it right here on campus. So this is the Vulcan Village. A key component to this that's already in place, university zoning. Gerald DiMello got that. You know how hard it is to get university zoning? It's either luxury resort or residential, and we have this special zoning called university zoning. Is that a good thing, Al? It's a good thing. Doesn't mean you circumvent EISs and environmental studies, but it does open up some doors so you can develop this parcel. This is 36 acres. This is prime time real estate. 
this can be a, uh, really a benchmark for our community, but it's gonna take a business vanguard community. You can't just hand this off to somebody here at UH Hilo. You can't hand it off to Carlton Ching over in Manoa. You need to have that business acumen here in Hilo to do that. I also want to see this come to fruition. It might not look like this, but this is the best picture I had. And this is hopefully Hilo Community College's, Hawaii Community College's future campus. There's a lot of work done under the previous chancellor on that. It's expensive. We're talking three, four hundred million dollars. 150 million just in infrastructure alone because there's nothing there. No water, sewer, power, zero, right? So if you're not sure where this is, this is Komohana Street. This is um, College of Pharmacy, Imiloa. This is right across the street. So this is the intersection of Komohana and the Mohouli extension that goes up to Kamana Drive. It's, it's just, it's a rendering, but at some point we're gonna have to make a decision, right? How are we gonna grow HCC? It's landlocked, it's 24 acres, we have 2,500 students, we'll never grow it to 4,000 students if we don't have additional space. But it's, in a, it's a, in a unique area in downtown Hilo, or in, not downtown Hilo, but in Hilo. And so, you know, again, this business vanguard community could look at monetizing those 24 acres and possibly looking at PPP alternatives to build this future campus for HCC. If we build this, we can, we can grow HCC to be a premier vocational education center uh, in this state. This is one of my dreams one day, is to bring an aeronautical technological park to Hilo that would complement the Imiloa and the things that we have up there uh, that are associated with some of our uh, telescopes and ast astronomy uh, things that we do up on the mountain. Um, it would be a pillar of the uh, aviation program that I'd like to bring to UH Hilo one day. Um, and at some point we also need to look at what type of uh, manufacturing or, or jobs that we can bring to UH Hilo that can be a part of uh, aerospace uh, tech park. I think there's a lot of opportunity here in Hilo to do that. And so that's uh, something that I hope to, uh, to work on. But these are big projects, these are big ideas, but I think you need big ideas if we want to really grow this community and move it to the next level. Athletics. I see our athletics director up there. Thanks for coming, Pat. Athletics is important to me. I was a student athlete. Went to UH Manoa, walked on, was the last guy to make the UH men's volleyball team. Changed my life. You know, and uh, ended up becoming student athlete at UH Manoa, was the most inspirational player on the UH men's volleyball team in 1997. Uh, and so there is a um, direct correlation to local kids playing sports, whether it's at the high school level or at the collegiate level. Um, student athletes that come here, um, you know, whether it's fitness or competitiveness or drive or discipline, teamwork, all fantastic attributes. And it's not just for the student athletes, it's also for the students that aren't playing in sports too. Because you come to the gyms and you support the teams and you have that camaraderie between student athletes and students. And so I think athletics uh, is very important. Athletics can drive enrollment, right? We recruit students to come here, that and drives enrollment. It heightens uh, uh, the profile here at UH Hilo when we have a strong athletic program. Of course that results in direct profits, right? Through tuition, it can help our enrollment. We can use it for branding. Um, we're doing a lot of these things, but I think we can do better. Athletics is important for Hawaii. Hilo, this is a basketball town. Everyone likes uh, sports. And it gives local kids an opportunity to participate. The challenge is we're an island state. You can ask our athletic director about the budget and being the most isolated place on the planet and having to compete with teams on the mainland and travel costs are extremely expensive. It takes up a lot of our budget. And you don't have enough resources, Pat, and I wish the legislature, and I hope we can appropriate more to not just UH Hilo, but to also UH Manoa. But um, it has limited resources. I, it blows my mind how much your assistant coaches and, and uh, you know, get paid on, for um, basketball and some of the other sports. It's, it's pretty much, they're doing it for love. You know, they're doing it because they love the sport, they love the team, they love the players, they love this university. But I think we as a state can do better. But I also think there's a disconnect between athletics, the university, and the community. I'd like to see more community participation for Vulcan Athletics. I know we have an event coming up soon. I think it's at the Student Life Center, right? Meet the athletes, I saw that in the paper. I encourage everybody to go to that. Um, athletics department requires leadership. It requires fundraising, it requires engaging with the community. We have a very passionate alumni 
uh, Vulcan Alumni um, Association of, of Athletes, and, and uh, you know, we really need to put that support behind our athletic program. One of the um, individuals came to me in our community, he runs our HyPal program, he says, how can we, is there any way we can have a community college athletics team, maybe just for basketball, that they would compete against the other seven community colleges? Because that's a way to recruit some local kids that maybe can't play at UH Hilo, but could play on the Hawaii Community College basketball team and play against Leeward and Windward and KCC and Kauai. Just an idea, you know, to uh, get a few more students that um, excel in sports, that want to go to the community colleges that, that could play. So that was an idea I wanted to throw out there. New programs are important. And I think we need to develop uh, programs based on our islands and our state's work for, workforce needs. Ikaika here is uh, chief of staff at my office, and one of our out-of-session projects is to map Hawaii Island. Heat mapping. Where are the jobs on this island? Where um, do we have too many jobs? Where do, we have, where, where, are we, uh, where do we need jobs? How many more nurses do we need? How many more individuals do we need for the tourism industry? How many uh, um, doctors do we need? How many special education teachers do we need? How many regular teachers do we need? Where are the jobs on this island? So we've extracted that data from the DBED Hawaii State Data Book. We've talked to some of the largest employers on the island because I want to know where the jobs are. I want to know what those jobs pay. I want to know what it takes to get hired there. I want to know what the student needs to do in their educational career to get that job. And through the STAR GPS program that UH has, we can plug that right in. And if you want to be um, you know, a, a nurse at Hilo Hospital and they have a shortage there, then this is the fastest way to do it. This is how much it's going to cost. This is what you need to do. This is the grades you need to attain. This is how much you're going to get paid when you start there so that we can start educating those high school seniors to start picking career choices um, early on in their careers. So we are working on that. Some new programs I'd like to see is commercial aviation here at UH Hilo. Me being a pilot, it's a, huge, it's a huge vacuum. There's a massive pilot shortage in America. Um, and any of you want to pick up a career in aviation, be a pilot, just come and see me. Some other potential programs, veterinary medicine, occupational therapy. Go talk to Dan Brinkman at Hilo Hospital. You ask him, who is the most important person in the hospital? Who do you think it is? Think it's a surgeon? You think it's a nurse? The most important person at Hilo Hospital is the coder. That person is the one that gets the hospital the money. Right? They're the ones that types in the medical coding. Career opportunity. And there's community colleges that you can get a degree in medical coding, right? Because of healthcare and it's escalating costs. Doctors don't have time for a coder to screw up because that's going to take three to four months before that doctor or that hospital can get paid. There's one person who's like a coding master at Hilo Hospital and if when she gets sick and she goes down, the, ho the hospital hurts. We can use medical coders and they get paid pretty, pretty good money. So that's a, a program I think we should look at. That would be under uh, our community colleges. They, they have a program like that in Las Vegas. Cybersecurity is very important. Um, we're doing it on uh, Oahu, Center to Donovan de la Cruz up in Wahiwa, um, tied into uh, West Oahu, um, working with the Navy, working with uh, the military, has a, a great cybersecurity program, and that's something we can look at. You know. I also feel like on this island we have some unique things that are found nowhere else in the world that we should be the very best at. And I'm not saying we're not, but we should define ourselves as the very best in astronomy, tropical agriculture, meteorology or volcanology, right? Geosciences, pharmacy, education, marine sciences, and of course the pico of Olelo Hawaii right here at Kahakaula, and that's our Hawaiian language and our Hawaiian studies program. We should be the very best at that. Students should want to come all over the world because we are the best for astronomy, marine science, learning our Hawaiian language, um, or, or uh, pursuing a career in tropical agriculture. That can give us a distinct competitive advantage over other universities and programs. I only have two slides left, and so I'm going to stop here because this is a statewide tour that I'm about to embark on starting next month. Um, individuals like Calbert are going to join me. 
Uh, we're going to come back here to UH Hilo. I'm going to bring uh, senators from the higher education community that want to join me. Um, and I want to meet with each and every one of you, the faculty, the administration, the students, the staff. I want to hear your concerns. I want to hear what's important. I want to see CIP projects we need to fund. And I want ideas of how we can grow this university so that when I go back in 2018, we can introduce legislation, whether it's fiscal bills or non-fiscal bills. We can work with the university. We can expand the Hawaii Promise Program so we can fund four-year students, not just our community colleges. But that takes money. To give an example, the Promise Program costs $4 million for community colleges. It would have cost about $13 million if we went statewide at all three uh, four years. So it was a significant more uh, increase in money. And unfortunately, the legislature had what it had. We were fortunate to get the Promise Program. And at least 1,000 students will be able to pursue uh, higher education at our community colleges. So I'm going to stop here.